You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 255 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by HandsOnGloves.com. The all-in-one, revolutionary bathing, grooming, shedding gloves. Anybody shedding these days? Horsemanship Radio is part of the family of the Horse Radio Network. And today, Monty Roberts is back to tell us some specific and fascinating insights about the horse's language and how it's formed and how we can learn it to help train our horses in partnership and certainly without violence. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month. Doesn't it, Jen? I have my producer, Jen, with me. Dun, dun, dun. You work so hard to get those things out right on time every month, and I'm always, like, pulling up the rear going, like, oh, yeah, that's right. i got to add the photos, or i got to put the description. <laughs> You've got a lot of plates in the air. There are a lot of plates there. It's okay. I, I enjoy it, and I'm so glad I have you as my support. I think you're going to have fun with this. Dad and I sat down over a recorder and um, got to talking about this work he's doing with some Mustangs that are here right now. They're part of a, it's not a sanctuary. It's actually, they do adopt some of these horses out, but I would call it more of a research uh, area where they bring in these bands, small bands of horses, wild horses that have been pretty much untouched in pockets of the western united states and they're trying to preserve the dna so these it's sciencey and wonderful to um the the strength behind the dna of these mustangs that have survived out there for hundreds of years now and so we wanted to talk about what's their language look like versus what does a domestic a horse born in domesticity what does that look like does that sound interesting to you jen i can't wait <laughs> I'm going to listen to this one with a glass of wine. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Yeah, this well, good. I, you know, yeah. But listen to the end. Don't fall asleep. That's what I would do. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll be on the edge of my seat. Yes, I'm fascinated because I've always wondered. Uh, I don't know a ton about the language of Echo. It's just what I can glean from my occasional visits to the movement or watching online on the university. I, I suck up little bits when I can. And I've always wondered... Th- about the subtle differences. Let's call them an accent. Are mm-hmm. you from the Northeast or are you from Louisiana? Uh-huh. Does, does their language look different? And I can't wait to find out from yeah. the guy who, who sort of discovered. I he disco- he, he's the one that, that, that unlocked that key. He found the lock. That's first. Okay. He found the lock first and then yeah. he put a key in it. That's a good, that's a good analogy. I love it. And I'm not going to give it away, but how do don't you Don't give it away. Think, no, 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 I won't. No I promise. But this is what they should listen for listeners. This is what you should listen for is what creates those accents. Oh, <gasps> it might be surprising. Oh, I never thought it might I, be surprising. Made it even more intriguing. There you go. There you go. Well, we're going to get right to it after we hear from our title sponsor, Hands on Gloves. A little quick hands on gloves nugget here. Please. Please. One of the ways you can help ho- improve your horse's hoof quality mm-hmm. is to massage his coronary yes. bands. Coronary and bands. guess what works really, really well for that? My hands on gloves do. Done! <laughs> Absolutely! They are fantastic for massaging the cornet. Mm-hmm. And one of, uh, what, when, if you're one who uses uh, hoof conditioners, if mm-hmm. you rub a little bit on their coronary band, that's where the hair and the horn meet. And you put it on there and you rub it in with your hands-on gloves. Or, I don't use hoof conditioner, but I do massage his cornets regularly. You dig them in there. And especially when the weather is dry, it yes. really makes a difference. I think he enjoys it. I honestly think he does. 100%. 100%. And horses do enjoy. And remember, one thing that Jay Michelson, who owns the company, said is, don't tickle your horse. Really get in there and give them a good rub and watch that lip all moving and everything. Then you know you're getting it right. And and the shedding will probably prove it anyway. But but they they do love a good, you know, not creepy, not like, you know, don't tickle them. 
Get in yeah. there and really rub it, rub it down. And we're pulling yeah. out hair here. I mean, we we could be knitting something somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> hair yeah. And something I found because I I work with a lot of sensitive horses in my little world. Mm. If you just lay the glove on their body, some big fat muscle like on the top of their croup for the mm. sensitive source that get all itchy, scratchy. Ooh, don't touch me. Just mm-hmm. lay it there. And just let your like let the weight of your hand lay there. And they go, oh, uh-huh. that's not so bad. And then you just gently push. Ah. And then release. And then gently push. And then release. And do that for three, four times. And then you just gently push and quite literally just move your hand back and forth. Not even enough to move the glove, but enough to move your hand inside the glove. Mm. If if you do that, maybe do that in addition to your regular grooming routine. Do that for several days or a week. And gradually, in tiny little increments, one of our favorite words around here. Yeah, that's true. You're going to have a horse who goes, oh my gosh, get that glove out. He's anticipating it being uncomfortable. Therefore, it is. That's true. Very good. That's right? that's a sensitive. Yeah, that's the sensitive horse. You're absolutely right. And pretty soon they'll be, you know, they're into pressure. They'll be leaning into your hand and telling you where their favorite spots are. That's right. They will. And we're going to get to our guest. So welcome back, Monty Roberts, Thank you to your much. own Horsemanship Radio, uh, the podcast. And uh, we decided that we would sit down today and talk a little bit about these wild horses that you do have right now on the farm. But I wanted to wind it back and go to some of your roots, though, and ask some questions about what does that mean, wild horse, and what is the language that you talk about, equus, and how are they different, what creates those differences? These are some of the things that I wanted to ask you about. Are you willing to answer those questions? I'm excited about doing this because... They're my life. And um, it just so happens that I'm doing a book right now. I am so excited to look into the things that I've done in my life and realize the life I've had. And my life started and built through the middle and is now finishing with wild horses and the behavior of wild horses. I love it, and I'm ready to tell you my thoughts. Yeah, and that represents quite a few years. What, what, what span of years are we talking about with all this experience? We're talking about just a little less than 90 years. I'm 89 in a couple of days, and um, I was on a horse at three, and I was in competition on a horse at four, which I won. I know it's hard to explain that a four-year-old riding a horse, running, stopping, running, sliding, spinning, etc., could win a competition. There's more to the story, but I won it. And then they put me in the business of, for 10 years, doing stunts, because three out of five movies in Hollywood were made with a child and a horse in them. And getting a child to do the stunts that were necessary to make the movie acceptable was a very difficult thing to do. Parents didn't want that. And uh, my father did. And they paid. But it was illegal. Um, And I just, I mean, I'm full of stories about the illegality of what I did without knowing it was illegal. Why? Pretty... What does a five, six, right. seven-year-old know about legal and illegal? But anyway, yeah, you do most it. of it included either wild horses or horses that were wild right. <laughs> because of how they were trained. Well, that's, it's very interesting that you're doing that second book now, a follow-on on The Man Who Listens to Horses, probably in a different um, title. But we'll be looking for that. But I think it's interesting, too, that you've been able to come back around to the wild horses because that's one of, well, actually threaded throughout. Wild horses figure prominently, even in The Man Who Listens to Horses, because people often say that that story of you going out to the Nevada desert and uh, riding a wild horse back to camp is one of the stories that resonates most with them. Some people do. So I wanted to, I wanted to expand on on that a little bit. And you are always saying you're you're continually learning. You're a student for life of the horse, 
And what's been interesting with this gentling pen that you've designed here to have two horses at a time in is that there's a lot of learning going on, not only for the students and the Mustangs, but even for you. You've made innovations over the years and continue to today. So I wanted to draw a line in the sand kind of where you are today with what you you often call the language of Equus, but then you usually correct yourself and say, well, it's it's really a communication system of sources of sort with horses. What do you mean by a communication system of horses, and, and why do you say that? Well, it isn't a language because a language is linga or linguo or lingua. Um, depending on what country you're in. And that means words, and generally that means an alphabet with letters. Well, horses are not in that category at all. So it's not a language, really, but it's the communication system of horses, which we have too. We can sit with two deaf people uh, sign languaging themselves back and forth <laughs> with their fingers and their hands and their arms. And they get the point across and, and sign language for humans is very effective. There's a lot of things going on in that world, but horses have a language. They can tell another horse a quarter of a mile away what's going on because there isn't the necessity of words or sound. It's the necessity of gestures. Ears play a role. Legs play a role. Necks, the back plays a role. Tail plays a role. All of those things and how they use them can be a situation whereby they get a point across. They are managing to get their, their words right through language without words being spoken. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody who's watched the hierarchy in a pasture of four or five, doesn't matter if they're all mares, geldings, or mixed, there's a hierarchy going on through a lot of language in the eyes, the ears, the the adjustment of the body, loading up to the kick, you know, all these things without any sound. So I think we all kind of get what you mean by language. And then, of course, we know from your iconic join-up that you're emulating a predatorial body language. And we also know the statistic that between two humans talking, whether they're just talking with their mouths, not even sign language, body language communicates much more than words do often. So so very few people in the equestrian world actually get the opportunity to work with wild horses. So what is what do you say is the difference between body language in wild horses versus horses born in domesticity? Yeah, it's a shame that horses born in domesticity um, can't really learn all of the finer communication systems of the wild horses. However, the wild horses require the human to be better at what it, he does or she does, very much so uh, because they are so quick, they are so demanding, they are expecting perfection from you very quickly, while the domestic horse is a little bit lackadaisical when you come right down to it with their similar body language or body communication system to the wild horse. It's similar, but it's brushed over or toned down, uh, a bit blunted off, as opposed to being as sharp as the Mustang is. That must be really interesting to watch and to, to be walked through as a student, too. So observing the wild horses in the gentling pen that you've designed, it's pretty obvious when humans interact with the untouched horses that the better the human is at being very clear with their gestures, the quicker the horses are gentled, right? Oh, no question. If I take, um, you know, an upstart horseman 
who would maybe even call himself a professional trainer of horses, into the round pen, into the gentling pen, we'll say. I use round pen so much because that's the starting process where you actually saddle them. But I have a gentling pen that's kind of an octagon uh, with no sharp corners, uh, and it has two chutes where you can put them in a closed area and then you can get your hands on them right away. But um, I can go into that gentling pen with someone who's, let's call them a horseman. They're, they're, they may be very good at what they do. But you put a wild horse in there with them and then you either take the same one, which isn't fair, so we switch them and, and you bring a even wilder one in for me. And I am half the time, literally half the time of a good horseman taking a wild horse in the gentling pen and getting the things done that you want to do. What is it you want to do? You want to put a halter on, you want to lead them, you want, don't want them to kick you, you don't want them to bite you. You don't want them to run over the top of you. Um, you want them to end up with this lesson we're going to do with the halter on. And you walk and they walk with you. And you're not injured. I can't remember any injuries I ever had in that gentling pen. I don't think it's one. I remember one time I went in there and I got this condition called diverticulitis and I was in there with a lot of pain that's the only time I remember <laughs> I was in that gentling can't pen blame the mustangs pain. for that no <laughs> but you've had the opportunity in the gentling pen to work with some of the best horsemen in the world so what are some of these common traits we all want to know the secrets what are the common traits of good horsemen in the gentling pen well first of all I can tell immediately how they breathe and breathing is critically important why? Because the horse can read your breathing from a quarter of a mile away. Well, what do you mean by read my breathing? What I mean is that if you breathe diaphragmatically, it, it relaxes your entire body, whether you like it or not, or whether you try or not, it relaxes your entire body. Now, if you get really good at diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, Joanna Lowe's from Wales is, is the darndest person. When I, I mean, she was tough and breaking horses and jumping horses and all of that kind of thing. And um, she wanted to get closer to my kind of training. And I remember having her here on this place, just outside the room we're in now. And uh, we were dealing with the deer. And this lady took her um, heartbeat, we had a machine, uh, we had a, a sensor that we could put on both of us. And she took her heartbeat outside with the deer from 67, 68 to 47, 48. Yeah. After one, one hour of me teaching her how to diaphragmatic breathe, the deer were right next to her. Yeah. They felt completely comfortable because her body spelled out no... Nothing to worry about, huh? Yeah, no problems with no this person. They're no. not mm -hmm. angry. They're not dangerous. Nervous, fearful. Yeah, that's yeah. wild deer. Yeah, that's a wild deer. That's right. So with horses, Well, all horses, deer are 10 times more sensitive than horses are. And that lady is running her own operation in Wales now and getting enormous acceptance from her students. Um, doesn't surprise me at all. I'm right. very she proud was of five it. years your rider on tour. So yeah, some she was people... on tour for five years with me mm -hmm. and she did a fantastic job and she'll be here at the movement in June of 2024. One of the things that I was excited to ask you about, though, today is that you, you point out that often there are differences between wild horses in an area that's heavily predated, right? 
a lot of predators, versus an area in the world that has very few predators for the horses, possibly. You sometimes call these horses have different accents. You say it, ha- it might have a different accent because of the predatorial environment. Tell us about that. Well, you know, we have to think back 200, 250 years to what people did in their relationship with the horse. The first thing was we did was eat them. Mm. Um, and then we grew out of the eating them to using them to do things. And that went up China and Mongolia and so forth and so on. That's where all that got started. Using them, they carried loads and all sorts of things. So those people didn't know how to train a horse, but they got them trained and they didn't fear them. Now the horses were 10 hands and um, they didn't ride them that much. But the children did ride them, and the wives would often ride them carrying a baby, mm-hmm. tiny ones, you know, and and they mumbled along. Uh, and if you look back at wh- what the relationship was, human and horse, it's an amazing change that has taken place where you go to Holland and see these big, strong, massive horses, we call draft horses now. Where did they come from? choice of the body that's born and then the two biggest ones made it mm-hmm. and then another big one and so forth and so on mm-hmm. until you get a, a, a complete change and now we ride horses basically from about 900 pounds to uh, three quarters of a ton mm-hmm. and um, uh, it, what they do what they say in their own language to you is all important to getting along with them and deciding what they should do with their life. Mm -hmm. You know, you you don't take a four-bottom plow and hit your pony to it. They can't pull it. But you get that monster draft horse and he can pull it. Mm -hmm. So learning to live with horses as they live with us Mm -hmm. is critical to A, loving them, B, getting along with them, Mm -hmm. and C, even go in competition and try to beat somebody else Mm -hmm. because your horse is better at what you've chosen to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, matching the horse to the discipline, but sometimes... Like yeah. Johnny Tivio, maybe over, well, right, over there's, a there's some horses that can broaden that spectrum and do four or five different things darn well. They are geniuses uh, when they can do that. Mm-hmm. Johnny Tivio was world champion, rain cow horse. And Johnny Tivio was a world champion, cutting horse. Now, both of them are working cattle, but they're vastly different. And he would know by the bit that I put on him what we were going to do that day. That's crazy. And you could go out there and he would be a cutting horse and do things. Cutting horse, you don't even pick the reins up. You can't. It's a point every time you touch their mouth. A point off. Off, yeah. Every time they touch, you touch their mouth. So the rein cow horse, you take a hold of the reins with a cricket in the bit, lots of copper in their mouth. And you run after the cow. The cutting horse can't go forward right. close to the cow. He just keeps the cow out of the herd. Separated. That's mm-hmm. there, separated from the herd. Mm-hmm. And you don't, ha- you can't guide him. Right. Or they take a point off every time you guide him. He has to do it himself. I love both of those. But in my lifetime, I had horse of the world in thoroughbred racing that was the same horse twice in a row, horse of the world, Mm. winning the uh, race in Paris. Arc de Triomphe. hmm? L'Arc de Triomphe. The Arc de Triomphe. Mm -hmm. He won it two years in a row and then was retired. I I bought him for 30 or $40,000, 40 some thousand dollars. And 
he won about $3 million. And then they syndicated him and bred him, and he earned maybe 8 to 15 or $20 yeah. million. Dollars. So that was an experience for yeah. me. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I had horses that I paid less than 10000 for that went on to win races that were $100,000 mm-hmm. and act for one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He, he, now, I, I had a horse one time that I rode. And I rode him only in Gymkhana, yeah. musical chairs. And you got points for the all-around if you oh, right. if you won first, second, or third in the musical chairs. And this horse won 45 musical chairs in succession, never to be second. This was Brownie? No, it wasn't even Brownie. It was a horse that was just a bay horse. Yeah. And uh, his happened. His name happened to be Jerry, oh. but um, I don't know if we called him Jerry or what. And he wasn't a personable horse, but he could run, really run. And he learned how to run horses off. And so I would be just inside and have them pass me on the outside. <laughs> and he would, you had to be cantering. You couldn't trot. You couldn't walk. If you did, you're out. Yeah. And he could canter almost in place like without horse. moving forward. <laughs> so the other horses are all passing him. But always there was a chair in front of me. And when the music stopped, I could just step off of him on the long rope. I had about a 25, 30 foot rope. He would run the other horse wide so the other person couldn't beat me to the to chair. The chair. <laughs> it was, you know, that's the way I lived. Incredible. And, um, yeah, I, I, I rode in virtually any contest that you could ever imagine with horse and rider. Monty likes to say that the concepts inherent in the language equus are based upon always giving the horse the power of choice. This is why he created his online university. So rehabbing and rehoming racehorses. You want to save them all. We get it. You will love this series with Monty and Jamie Jennings, host of Horses in the Morning and a certified Monty Roberts instructor out of Oklahoma. They work together on retraining X racehorses or off the track thoroughbreds for new purposeful careers. See this series at MontyRobertsUniversity.com. It kind of makes me think about how when you work with a horse, so we've mentioned that you're you're working with a horse to figure out what he does best, or maybe even in two or three categories in the case. But when you do you adjust your work when you work with a wild horse based on how they react with you or kind of what you know about their background? Maybe a pet like in a wild horse it would be a predatorial environment like if you knew that he was coming from a certain type, do you, does that adjust your work? I don't even know how to answer that because my work after I really learned the language equus, my work is guided by the horse and I go where the horse needs me to go. Do I tell my feet where to go? Do I tell my arms, my hands, my eyes? Do I tell my breath what to do? No. I, I am talking to that horse and he's responding to me without anything that looks like communication at all because it's all body communication. Mm-hmm. His communication is body communication. He doesn't have any words. And my body is in communication. I don't even know what I'm going to do when I see him. Let's pick up that thread of Mustangs in the Western United States. We know that they see a lot of predators. Um, you, you know, there's there's cougars, there's bear, there's everything out there, right? Wolves. Um, so if they're born in the wild, they've likely seen a, a predator or two, rattlesnakes, things like that too. 
Um, have you ever been able to work with horses who have had little contact in the wild with predators, a different kind of environment? Yes, I have. Tell us about that. Well, um, I worked with horses on the islands just off Seattle. And there's no predators out there. And they grow up, little, little herds of them. And then I worked with them. And they're vastly different from right. those horses yeah. that are raised with, with predators sort of predator. mm -hmm. in the Mustang family. Right. And the whole family is different from the families out there on those And how, how does it look differently to you? And what does it look like? Well, if they don't have that, they don't peak up their flight mechanisms okay. so that they can get the heck out of there, away from those things. So you can get closer to the wildest horse in New Zealand than you can the gentlest Mustang in Nevada. Yeah. yeah. So less sensitivity. Much less, less. less worry about... Absolutely okay. less worry. It's yeah. still there. And okay. the, uh, the units of the body are still in there, but they haven't been peaked up. Gotcha. And that's interesting because that's what you're looking for is how peaked up that is and how you round that off with your own physiology, I guess, and your gestures. But you've worked with champion thoroughbreds. That's a domestic horse, well-bred, pedigreed, you know, high-end. And then you've got the Mustang that, you know, maybe you have a Spanish barb, some pure, pure, pura sangre, sangre, right? The pure blood Mustang, the pure blood thoroughbred. Do you have a preference over the sensitivity? Those are both sensitive, and I know Mustangs can do a lot of things, but you maybe know, they. Uh, Debbie, I, I don't have a sense, of, I don't have a preference because of sensitivity at mm, all. Okay. I have an idea where the horse is going to go. Okay. And I might change what I do with that horse because of the direction the horse is going to go. Mm -hmm. But I tell you honestly, I love to work with all those sections mm -hmm. of horses. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. And this is why I'm not in the racing business. You can't stay in the racing business, in my opinion, and just do the same thing over and over again and hope that the horse can run fast enough to win races. To me, that's, there's not enough in that um, for me to be excited about working with that horse. They were bringing me a lot of horses, for instance, that wouldn't go in the starting gate. They brought me so many that wouldn't go. Well, they'd whipped them and caused them to fight. Mm -hmm. And then the horse generally gets hurt and the horse is angry and I get them, and they, right. in, in 10 days, they're walking in the starting gate, standing there, and then cantering off. Yeah. So I know what to do with those kind of things. A horse that won't load in the trailer or the truck. Uh, a horse you can't do this with, a horse you can't do that with. I love, I love to work with those kind of things because they tax mm -hmm. your ability. Yes to join forces with the horse to learn what he needs to know. Right. And I think that's probably your preference is how do you help that horse? So whether it's a sensitive Mustang that doesn't trust anyone, any human, or if it's a remedial thoroughbred that really has had human problems, not horse problems, then you're, you call that the challenge yeah. that you can you can control yeah, and better we than anybody else. We haven't talked about equipment you might use. Right. And I don't w want to use any equipment that and, yeah. causes pain. Yeah. So I've got some equipment that I've designed myself. Mm -hmm. It isn't sold anywhere. That will really help you get those things done with a horse. Mm -hmm. The dually halter. The, yeah. Right. Gets smaller when the horse resists it and bigger when the horse yeah. does Behaves. the right thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love our university, all those lessons. I was working out today that you have 
over 5,000 Q&As done as a reference library. Can you believe that? Because we've done that since 2004. We've, we have about 850 or more uh, university video lessons mm -hmm. online right now. Mm -hmm. And um, the, I mean, we have Q&As, we have the uni lessons, and then we have um, all those, uh, the books that you put out, the DVDs that you put out. I mean, really, you're a, a media company more than an equipment company yeah. because your commitment to education for yeah. people. But ultimately, what it comes down to is them coming and taking a course so that you really, you know, you, you can't learn everything from a book or a video. Yeah. But, I'll yeah. tell you a quick story mm -hmm. about getting older. Um, when I was getting well into my 60s, I had a horse I couldn't get on, and that's Chrome. Nice Chrome is his name. He's a lovely horse. But the bugger was a squirmer when you go to get on. And he would step sideways and stuff. And I was having a heck of a time getting on him because I needed a mounting block. And I, now I can't ride at all, but I needed a mounting block. And could I get him to stand up to the mounting block? As soon as I lifted my foot to yeah. put it in the stirrup, <laughs> he just took one big step and he was gone. And I didn't want to start beating him up for it. That wouldn't make him want to be with me. Exactly. So I had a, a young boy called... Hector. Yeah. Hector mm -hmm. from Mexico mm -hmm. that came up here at about the age of 16 or so. And he told me, I was, he saw me wrestling with mm -hmm. this business of getting on Chrome. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, I should know everything to do with the horse by the time I'm in my 60s. Right. Well, I couldn't get on him. And, and he came around and I said, could you hold him? Could you push him over here? And he did. And he said, Mr. Roberts, in Spanish, hmm. Mr. Roberts, why don't you teach him to come to the mounting <laughs> block and turn and give you the stirrup? I said, yeah, that's wonderful. You can't teach a horse to do that. And he said, I can. I did it when I was four, five, six years old down in Mexico so I could get on when my father wasn't there to throw me on. I taught the, my horse to come to the mounting block and side pass up to me. And I s threw him my lead rope. And I said, I'm going to Germany. And I think they have another country for me. I'm going to be gone about three or four weeks. When I come back, you, you, you think you have him? Oh, yeah. I'll have him ready for you when you come. Good. And so we laughed about it, and I made a joke to Pat and Debbie and everybody I saw mm -hmm. about this kid that thinks he can make chrome. He can't do it. <laughs> come up to a mounting block on his own. Yeah, by choice. No, 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 no pulling or anything. Put him on a 30-foot line, take him 30 feet away and just turn him loose and start clucking. So I got back and this young man in his teens said, just go over and get on the mounting block. And he went to the end of the rope with chrome. The end of the resident rope, it was a Lead. driving line. Yeah, 30-foot yeah, line. 30-foot mm -hmm. line. Went to the end of the 30-foot line and unclipped unclipped oh. and said cluck to him <coughs> cluck to him like that oh, okay who's going to catch him now yeah. and That's he cool. started walking toward me and he said oh keep clucking <coughs> and he walked straight to me turned sideways sided up to the mounting block and I got on and I said I'm never going to doubt anybody <laughs> I'm gonna try every time. I didn't invent it, <laughs> and I didn't know it. This young Mexican boy knew it. I think you gave him credit, yeah. Yeah, N now I say keep them on the line. Yes. Just, just to be safer, Yeah. you know, so he doesn't get loose when you're training and everything. And I'm sure he had him on the line f for a while. Mm -hmm. And I, if I was to get on him today, mm -hmm. I would leave him on the line yeah. to come to me. But he will come from he knows 30 what feet he's away. Doing. Yeah, he knows what he's doing. It's yeah. incredible. 
So each and every one of you that are listening could learn one, two, three, four, five, ten things that you never knew about horses that will help you absolutely, indefinitely. If they will do it better. You will be safer. Yep. Um, more fun. More fun. Lots more fun. <laughs> Lots more fun. You never have to worry about mounting and dismounting somewhere because you always can find a place that, to... That, that little kid is training horses here in this area yep. today. Yep. And he does a hell of a... He's raised some sons and daughters of his own that can do the same thing. So I'm not saying he's he knows everything and he can go, you know, win the world championship in any contest. But just think about it. It's knowing the horse... I'm being at one with the horse mm -hmm. that's fun yeah. and, uh, and really works. Yeah, and you know what's really fun is that you've shared this with the world because it would just be with him had you not picked it up and gone. So we're really happy that you do this podcast, yeah. that you do the university. Well, I should and you tell share. you, too, okay. that Queen Elizabeth saw that Yes. when I first showed it. In the thing you called... Uh, yeah, the movement. Yeah, The movement. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. She yeah. saw it online. Yeah, live, streaming. And she called me and said, Monty, I want everybody that deals with my horses to do this yeah. with them. And I said, okay. And um, Simon Stokes is over there. She's dead and gone now. But Simon Stokes is in Germany. Mm -hmm. And Terry Pendry is still with the queen and both of them do this mm -hmm. with every horse with in the, the horse. royal family mm -hmm. and every horse in the biggest family in horses in germany yeah with those two people that i've trained two dynasties of horses two yeah. dynasties yeah. yeah that's exciting it it's, is. it's exciting that they've kept an open mind i think the queen was one of the most open-minded oh, good yeah. horsewomen that you ever knew, and I think Simon Stokes and that whole family that supported good horsemanship were also very open-minded. And isn't it amazing when you keep your mind open um, how much you can do? And, yeah. I, and keeping the horse's mind open is probably your mission statement. And you yeah. can only shut that brain down if you do cause pain or yeah. you know, violate your mission. No matter what it is, never say these words. Oh, that stuff doesn't work. Come on. Don't say those words. Watch. If it doesn't work, put it out. Mm -hmm. But don't say those words. Mm -hmm. I said them about this thing with the coming mounting. to the mounting block. Mm -hmm. And it turned my brain around. I have not denied anybody <laughs> the right to say you ought to do it this way. I've watched. Mm -hmm. I've chosen. Mm -hmm. And I've succeeded. Mm -hmm. And that's what everybody should do. You should try it before you, mm -hmm. but yeah. And, but do it correctly too, you know, follow the bouncing ball. Don't just um, yeah. say, oh, it doesn't work because my horse didn't do it yeah. or my horse is slow or my horse is whatever. Don't blame the horse. No, blame your blame techniques. Me. Be a good student. Thanks, Dad. I appreciate it. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of the herd. Dear Monty, I really want to become a horse whisperer. I love horses, and this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I am 12 years old, but I know what my life's goal is. How am I going to get the information that I need to meet my goal? Monty's answer. I wish that there was some way in words that I could explain to you how wonderful it is to receive this question. Questions similar to this come to me regularly, and it's so gratifying to know that the world is changing and that young people want to become better educated in areas which allow them to work with their horses in the absence of violence. You and others in your age group are the most important people in the world to me. You represent the future of the horse industry and you give horse people a chance to apologize to the millions of horses that have been treated harshly over the centuries. Your question makes my life and all of my work worthwhile. 
It gives me great pleasure to be able to tell you that there are more educational opportunities for you today than there ever have been. I recommend that you read every question and every answer in this book, and there are 170 of the most common horse problems solved. When you have finished, and if you want to be a violence-free trainer of horses, it is critical that the first thing you do is learn their language. Take a look at my Equus Online University at MontyRobertsUniversity.com. Once one has mastered the language of Equus, then everything else becomes easier and more fun. If you are dedicated to your goal, you will become familiar with all the videos, notes, challenge questions, and the library of Q&As and meet other students on the forum. Having accomplished this, then you could look into the areas of formal education available to you at our school, the Monty Roberts International Learning Center. Learning the intricacies will take far longer. It is a lifelong journey to be the best you can, but certainly anyone, including you, can become a horse whisperer. Your stated goal makes you very important to me as I have dedicated my life to educating others in my concept. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to MontyRoberts.com and click on the words Ask Monty at the bottom of the page. Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, in May. Here we are. We're right on the cusp of Monty's special training, May 13th through 17th. Then in June, we have... June 10 through 14 is our Gentling Wild Horse course. That's five days here at uh, the California Horse Center on Flag is Up Farms. Then June 21 through 23 is my annual The Movement. So Nellie Kennedy and I started this thing. It'll be seven years ago to this month in June. And um, we're so, so excited to have Jared Rogerson back and Jamie Jennings back. And then we're bringing in Joanna Lowe's from Wales. Man, go look at her Facebook page. She is an incredible trainer. She was five years on the road with dad as his rider. And she's really good. She's a certified instructor and others. One of them is our guest from um, next week, which is Katrina, or the next episode, Katrina Kofod. And she is an expert in all kinds of um German engineering tools for our horses. Uh, very cool. And then in July, 8 through 12, we have Monty special training. And this we're doing pretty regularly now because there's so many horses out there that want his attention. So come July 8 through 12. And if you didn't get all that to memory, who did? You can go to MontyRoberts.com. You can find all that and more, including this here podcast. Monty's calendar or Monty's calendar. Monty's calendar, his equipment. All the things Monty can also be found by giving a call to 805-688-6288. That's right. And that's right. And for details about today's show, you can go to horsemanshipradio.com and you're going to find links and photos, more information about today's guests and topics. And we love your feedback and we love to hear from you on social media. No, we we do not hate like social media. Right. Stop hating on social media. We <laughs> like it just fine. Monty's, Monty on Facebook is Monty Roberts, the one with the little blue check mark. And on Twitter, as well as Instagram, it is Monty underscore Roberts. And many thanks to our sponsors, too. Jay Michelson at handsongloves.com. And then, of course, Monty Roberts for our Monty Roberts University.com. And be sure to visit all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours. 